me hot chocolate chip cookies. And you're going to make me live here forever? His name is Buddy Ravel. I don't have to rinse, and Mommy doesn't have to rinse. definitely help. superior Rocky Road. Come on. I'll race you. I'll hop on one leg. I'm not allowed to run. I'll hop on one leg and hold my breath. Is she calling us? I think she's calling you. What do you think she wants? She wants you to taste her spider soup. Stop that! You know, it was all just a terrific group of people. Um, Gene Sachs, who directed it, and Neil Simon, who, you know, is Neil Simon. And it was nice for me because it was close to home, because the set was in Queens. And I grew up right, right you know, on the Queens, right. Long Island border. And it was a really lovely group of people, you know, really professional. Um, all people who had been, who were seasoned and had been around a long time. And this was where I got this chair from. They made me the chair that I still have to this day. Um, but there was a manager in the audience who saw, noticed my brother. Didn't notice me, but noticed my brother. And so um, the next week or whenever we went to the manager's house and my brother was, you know, the kid who you asked him a question and he would do the complete opposite. You asked him to do something and he was, he was so oppositional. Um, but anyway, I was there. So they said, let's meet with you. And they um, had me read a script and they were like, wow, she's terrific. Um, let's send her out to meet the agent next mm -hmm. week. This was, you know, these were managers. I went to meet the agent and I started auditioning immediately for commercials. I think the first commercial I did was Thomas's English Muffins. I did the first commercial for McDonald's Chicken McNuggets. And then I did um, a really great commercial for Pillsbury Chocolate Chip Cookies. New improved Pillsbury Chocolate Chip Cookies have more chips. How do you know there's more chips? Cause me and mom baked some yesterday. Really? You made hot chocolate chip cookies? Real hot. All those chips were melting all over. Mm. Then I broke one. And like the chips were everywhere. I can't stand it. Then what? I ate it. <laughs> Chocolate chip cookies. Fresh and hot. And Pillsbury says it's best. Now there's more chips. The Valerie Harper Dennis Weaver movie, which was the first movie I did, which was called The Day the Loving Stopped. We filmed it in Arizona. It was the first time I ever saw a rainbow which I was and still am obsessed with rainbows, so it was very memorable um, for that reason more than the celebrities and everything else. Um, that movie, I also worked with um, Ali Sheedy uh, and Dominique Dunn. They played the older versions of us. It's, it was about a divorce, <laughs> and we were the younger kids, and they were the, the older kids. Judy. Go to sleep. I can't. That's keeping me awake. Well, go back to sleep. I can't with all that fighting. They're not fighting. They're just talking loud. This is Search for Tomorrow. How in the world could you have done something like that? It ain't hard to shove somebody. It isn't hard, and I know how it's done. I want to know why you did it. Muffy kept on hogging the drinking fountain. And you beat her up because she took too long a drink. I'm tired. Can I sit down now? No, you may not, darling. I'm not through with you. All right, what kind so of... So was probably the most tonight? stressful thing I did, but it was like the pressure of, you know, having to perform, literally perform, you know, at such a high level with such high stakes day in, day out was... It was a lot. And I don't think I even really realized it until I broke down one day when I came in and they gave me a scene that I was not prepared for that they said we were filming that day and it was like a 10 page scene so they hand me the scene and I lost my mind and I said my mother to my mother I can't do this I was crying I I was so overwhelmed and so nervous and you know petrified panicked how can I do this? I, how am I supposed to learn this scene and, and shoot film it, it today. in like two hours or three hours or whatever it was? So somehow I did it. Everybody said it was one of the best scenes I ever did. You mean you're going to make me live here forever? 
No, I'm going to let you live here for a while. Oh, gee. Look. But it was soon after that that I, I said, I need to be done with the soap opera. This is just too much. Hey, Cassie, that costume is great. I'm sorry. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? A bad witch, of course. Mm. I'll help with the dessert. Finish your liver. Finish? Do you see liver on my plate? You buried it under your potatoes. I know your tricks. Look how Laurie ate hers. I read something about you weren't thrilled with your look in that movie. Oh gosh. That the, the glasses and the braids and the... I mean, it was, it's a tough look to pull off as a, as a young teenager. Let's get real. I wanted to look pretty, you know, and that wasn't a pretty look. I had these big, clotty shoes and this frumpy little outfit. But, you know, it was, it was great. I mean, we, we totally bonded on, on that set, the, the younger people. Like, Johnny Silverman is really a great, great human being. His name is... Jerry Mitchell. Hi, Jerry. 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 Hi, I'm, I'm Jerry Mitchell. I'm with the school paper. <laughs> he just met the new kid in school. Does this guy play football? No. Good. He used to, though. Remember the story about the guy who pulled a knife on his coach? Yeah. That's him. Jesus. He was a continuation. He even took a swing at one of his teachers. And these guys aren't your average history types. They're like ex-cops or something. In fact, I heard they carry guns. He came here from continuation? Uh-huh. That's why they call it continuation, so you can continue murdering people and still graduate. What's this guy's name, anyway? So he was this super brilliant guy, Phil Shawano, who was the director. He was 24 years old, so he was like fresh out of film school. And he had done a short film that Spielberg had caught wind of. He, he grew up in Pasadena and, and went to USC film school. So, you know, he was a West Coast guy through and through and got hooked up with Spielberg. And um, Spielberg, you know, funded um, and supported this film, Three O'Clock High, that was going to be his first movie. So at the time when it came out, I think it kind of, I don't know, did what it did. But, um, but over the years, it just became this movie that people, guys especially, loved, like loved, like became obsessed with. Um, and I know this because for decades, I would meet people and they would tell me, especially in college when I was, you know, just a few years older, but probably still looked the same. And people will come up to me all the time, like, you're Brie from 3 O'Clock High. You know, what happens is, or what happened to me, which I think is probably the case with a lot of kids, is, you know, you start off kind of wanting to do it and being so excited and, you know, then you have a certain level of success and it's terrific and you're like, wow, this is super cool. And then all of a sudden it like really takes over your whole life. I was having trouble adjusting from my acting life to my regular life. You know, I felt very lost and misunderstood because nobody could relate to what I had been going through. You know, I had been on the set, I had been with all these actors, I had had, you know, just this cra these crazy experiences. And then all of a sudden I went home and I was expected to just be like, you know, back in high school. So mm. what I decided was I wanted to let the acting go and just be in high school and kind of have a normal life. was looking for books to be adapted into films. So I had all this experience in books. I had met all these great 
people, all these editors, all these agents. I was reading mm -hmm. these amazing, you know, I was reading these amazing books at this, these early stages and I just, I really loved it. And then um, I wound up interviewing for Jane Distel and Miriam Goderich, my bosses, and they, you know, I was going to start in a in a um, admin sort of role, but with the idea that I could really start developing my own books and my own list very quickly. So that was like slam dunk. Let's go. Let's do this. And so that's what I did. And so I started working there in 1999. Um, and here we are. And here you are. I did want you just to define being an agent and what that means in oh, sure. 20 easy. words, 20 words or less. I don't know about 20 words or 25. less. 25. Um, so the basic definition, to keep it super brief, of being an agent is I represent authors and develop ideas with them and sell their books to publishers. professor and um, a historian and um, just an incredible researcher and writer and loves telling stories about women, forgotten women in history. That's kind of her, her forte. She did a book on, she did the first biography of Eliza Hamilton, which I was responsible for that idea. We were looking for a new idea for her and I had I had just seen Hamilton. As you might see on my wall, I'm kind of obsessed with Hamilton and um, I loved Eliza's role in that show and learning a little bit more about her and I was so fascinated I wanted to know more and so I started researching I said I cannot believe there has never been a biography of Eliza Hamilton so we created the first biography of Eliza Hamilton. So that was your idea? That was my idea. everything about food and there are always new ideas and there are always new personalities and there are always new ways to think about how to recreate that chocolate cake by putting in coffee or adding you know a different element to make it more interesting like for example I have this cookbook coming out that called South of Somewhere it's coming out this fall and it's brought by a woman she's a food blogger who has been in South Korea. She lived in South Korea, South Africa. She's from South Africa, and now she's living in the American South. So that's why it's called South of Somewhere. Somewhere. So there's all these beautiful stories about her history and heritage um, and all these places she's lived. But what's beautiful and wonderful about the book, because so much of the cookbooks now have a lot of storytelling as well, I think that's what makes the good ones really rise above the pack. Mm -hmm. So just this week, I made a recipe in there. It was a um, pork... Uh, miso marinated pork. Okay. So it had this incredibly delicious miso, salty, you know, yummy um, flavor with like this traditional American dish, you know, like a pork butt, like a pulled pork. And it just was. It worked. It like blew your mind. It worked. Yeah. It like blew your mouth away. Like the flavors were just so, so incredible. Trends are tough in publishing because the cycle is so long from selling the book to having it release. So it's usually about a two year process from the time we okay. sell a book until it actually comes out. And I don't want to call this a trend because I think it's way more than that. But, um, you know, cultural appropriation and um, marginalized voices, that's what everybody wants. Um, you know, they want books that are going to be authentic, speaking to cultures. Um, that have not been maybe explored before or have not been explored in the way that we'd like to see them explored. I have a book on my list called Black Women's Wellness, which is by a black doctor. She wrote a book 20 years ago and then self-published a book because there was no market no for market. her book. And, you know, now there is. Matt Moore, who's the author, um, who I've worked with. This is the uh, fourth book I've worked with him on and his fifth book. His first book, he self-published. Um, it was called Have Her Over for Dinner. Um, he was able to get the book to Julia Moskin at the New York Times 
and she wrote about it in her annual roundup of best cookbooks of the year. And I said publicly after I read this, how did this guy get his book, self-published book, self -published into book. the New York Times? So he must have had a Google alert or whatever, and he reached out to me and said, are you interested in talking? And we talked and we decided to work together. He did a book called The South's Best Butts, and he did a book called Serial Griller, and this is his most recent, Butcher on the Block, which is um, his grandfather was a butcher, so he talks about his own personal family history. And he interviewed, he researched and interviewed butchers from really around the world. There's one in France, and he went and he took photos and he uh, met with them and talks about their history. And so it's all about family, community. You know, butchering is sort of the lens with mm -hmm. which you dig much deeper into, into family and community. So it's a terrific book, a beautiful book. I love being surrounded by books and writers and creative, you know, interesting, intelligent people and having, you know, an ability to, to be part of that creative process. And I also love the thing that I, I am happy about, I mean, I'm happy about many, many things in terms of my, my leaving acting and, and the film industry. Um, as frustratingly slow as it can be on the book side of things, and it is, um, when you sell a book, it gets made. <laughs> I mean, you have a book at the end of the day that you can hold in your hands. <laughs>